Welcome to our online worship this this morning. We are glad that you are here on this beautiful day, and I hope it is a beautiful day wherever you are and you're, you're watching this. As we prepare for worship, let us light our candle. We're lighting again the Paschal candle. It is the great 50 days of Easter, so we're lighting the Paschal candle to remember that we're in this special season. But wherever you are, if you can light a candle, and that'll help you remember that the presence of God is there with you. And then also, if you want to put out something white, white is the color of the Easter season, that'll also remind you of where uh, where we are in the course of the Christian year. So let's now go to Kelly, who has some announcements today. Good morning, everybody. We just have a couple announcements we want to share with you this morning. Finance meeting is going to be today at 3 p.m., We're also going to have a church council meeting this week. That's going to be Thursday, May 7th at 7 p.m. And we have um, another Bible study coming up. I'm going to be leading a study called The Faith of a Mockingbird. It's based on the book To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. And that study is going to begin on Tuesday, May 12th at 6.30. And we'll be meeting via Zoom. Um, And we'll meet every Tuesday at 6.30. And you can purchase your books online. And Blake will be sending out that link so you'll know where to purchase them in your weekly emails. And also, we have some exciting news. Um, I received a letter from our district that I'll be reappointed to Milford Hills and Methodist Church for another year, so we're very excited about that. Me too. Yay! (laughs) And we have a mission at Milford Hills and Methodist Church um, that guides us to carry out God's will in our world, and our mission is to love, serve, and live as Christ. And that begins in worship, so let's pray together. Patient God, increase our faith. Lord, when we think we can't go any further, call us back to you so that we can find rest and comfort and strength. Show us mercy as we strive to walk in the ways that you call us to. Amen. to a time of thanksgiving and offering in our service and again we cannot thank you enough for your continued gifts and support of our church it helps us to be able to continue to do ministry in many different ways in this time of social distancing 
we're so grateful for your faithfulness and your giving. And there are several ways that you can participate in giving. You can continue to give through your bank. You can give through the Tithely app. Just be sure to check the box that says that you'll expect ex- accept the small fee so that we can receive 100% of your donation. Um, and you can give online through our website. You can also drop off your um, offering to us um, in our secure mailbox, or you can mail your offering to us. So now let us pray and dedicate these gifts to God. Consoling and guiding God, we bring our offerings and our very lives to your altar this morning. Help us to hear your voice, your call to serve, and your encouragement to endure for the work of the kingdom. Lead us to the light and hope of this Easter season so we can joyfully and faithfully serve you in the world. In the name of Jesus, our rock and our redeemer, we pray. Amen. We miss, miss you. you. I miss youth group and communion the most. I miss youth group and confirmation the most. <laughs> I miss God Squad, Bob Biscuits, and communion the most. See you. See you. See you. What I mostly miss about church is going to youth. Another thing is not seeing everyone and meeting and greeting with each other. What I miss about church is seeing everybody on Sunday mornings, and um, I miss acolyting and helping out with the church. I miss going to church when I I miss seeing all the people, and I miss seeing my friends, and I miss um, acolyting, and I miss especially eating in the gathering room, and I love eating. Um, Donuts, especially, and Mr. Hunley's biscuits, and so, and I love to whenever some, whenever they make the pie that has the chocolate on top, and that whoever makes that makes a really good cake, and I would really like some more of that too, and it's all really good. That's my favorite thing of all eating in the mornings. What I miss about church is um. God Squad, Godly Play, and Sunday School. Miss you, Miss Laura. What I miss about church is God Squad, seeing all my friends, and acolyting. My, I really miss church. My two favorite parts are watching the acolytes and going to, to um, Godly Play. I love you. I miss my friends at church. Miss you, Daisy. Miss you, Rock. Bye bye. We come to a time of prayer in our service today, and we continue to lift up those that are in need of prayer this week. We continue to remember Doug and Melody Jones, Tom and Noel Burns, Renda and Light Barrier, Dale Williams, Joyce Powell. Linda Tuttero, Linda Swing, and we'll just pause now for a moment, and any others that need to be lifted up today, now we can name those aloud. God hears all of our concerns, whether we lift them aloud or whether we say them in our hearts. And we're so thankful that we have a God that knows the deepest desires of our hearts. So let us now turn to our Lord in prayer. Oh God, we wonder sometimes if you are really out here in this desert wilderness. It doesn't seem like a place where we would find you. We would love to simply meet you in a beautiful sanctuary instead. But in this wilderness, we will trust you. As we go deeper into the unknown, help hope replace our sorrow. 
let grief give way to new life. Remove our anger and let it be overcome by love. Turn our fear into peace. We're willing to go even further with you on this journey, Lord. And oh God, during this Easter season, and especially on this Sunday, revive us with your life-giving spirit. Lord, we long for you to refresh our souls. Revive us so that your light would surround the people of our congregation, especially those who are grieving, those who are ill, those who are lonely, and others who are on our hearts and minds this day. Revive us so that we may share the good news of what a faithful God you are in the story of your resurrected Son, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Let's hear our scripture today. It comes from Numbers chapter 14. We start in verse 1 and then going through verse 12. So hear now the word of God. The entire community raised their voice and the people wept that night. All the Israelites criticized Moses and Aaron. The entire community said to them, If only we were had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken by force. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to each other, let's pick a leader and let's go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly, the assembled Israelite community. But Jonah, Nun's son, and Caleb, Jehovah's son, For those who had explored the land tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite community, The land we cross through to explore is an exceptionally good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he'll bring us into this land and give it to us. It's a land that is full of milk and honey. Only don't rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are our prey. Their defense has deserted them, but the Lord is with us. So don't be afraid of them. But the entire community intended to stone them. Then the Lord's glory appeared in the meeting tent to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people disrespect me? How long will they doubt me after all the signs that I have performed among them? I'll strike them down with a plague and disown them. Then I'll make you into a great nation stronger than they. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words that I speak be those you want spoken. May our ears be open to hear what you want heard. May we be transformed by your living word who is present here through the gift of your Holy Spirit. Amen. There are moments in life when you know there's going to be life before this moment and then life after these moments. For me personally, there was life before May 25th, 2002, and life after. That is the day I made Alicia the luggiest person in the world. Sorry, I I misread that. That That is the day Alicia made me the luckiest person in the world when we got married. There's also life before kids and then after kid or than kids. I remember when I graduated Duke Divinity School on my 25th birthday, and I distinctly remember sitting in Duke Chapel and thinking, wow, the years of my schooling are now over, and now now real adult life begins. Two weeks later, 
I got married. Eight weeks after that, we moved to England to start a career in ministry. And there are other moments, you know, in the life of a congregation that it's marked by. The birth of a congregation like ours in 1955. It could be the first Sunday in a new sanctuary or a day of a pastor's leaving or a day of a pastor's arriving. These all mark moments when there was life before this moment and then also after it. We have these in our national history too. There was life on this continent before settlers from the east arrived. And then there was the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the emancipation of slaves, the start of the Great Depression in 1929, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, September 11, 2001. I truly believe that history will remember what we are living through right now as one of these moments too. There, there was life before COVID-19, and there's life after COVID-19. Now, we don't know when the life after COVID-19 will start but I'm going to challenge you to sit with some aspects of that reality. The staff of our church have started to do this, and church council will start to do this as uh, do this process as we meet later on this week. And here's the reality check that we need to sit with. Normal, it just doesn't exist anymore. The normal of February 2020, which feels like it was you know years ago, not just two months ago, will never be coming back. Now, now, please hear me. I do feel that eventually we'll get back to meeting in a, as a congregation in a sanctuary for worship. Yes, I do not know when exactly, but I do have faith that we will get back to that. However, there may be things that this virus changes in our structure, in our, in our habits, and how we do things. There are things that we may miss the most or might sting because we're going to have to leave them in the past. For example, when we, when we do... And when we are able to meet again and gather together again, we may need to remove the hymnals for a while. We can't spend time sanitizing them between services. And if we can only meet with 50 people at a time, we may need to expand the number of services we're able to welcome people so that we can have them you know, together or expand where we are doing worship. There are some in our congregation who will not physically show up again until there's a vaccine and a cure, and we understand that. So that might mean that our online presence needs to continue or improve, which may require us to update some of our equipment or our abilities so that we can live stream our worship every week or figure out other ways we connect with people outside and in the internet like we're doing now. Maybe we need to think smaller instead of bigger and start small group meetings in people's homes instead of a large Sunday school class meeting. Maybe we need to pause all potlucks and food oriented gatherings, which As you saw in the children's moment in youth, uh, many of them are going to be disappointed because that new normal might be without some of Bob's biscuits and cake. Now, I'm saying all this because, once again, the normal we knew will not exist again. We can't go back to the way life was. Only a new normal is going to be birthed in these moments further. It's a hard pill to swallow. But we need to face this reality because we do not, if we do not, there's going to be heartache and confusion and frustration when we do get to that place. However, if we do understand this as a whole congregation, then we can face the future, whatever it will look like, knowing that we are trying our best to continue to live into our mission to love, serve, and live as Christ. When the Pharaoh, let the Israelites go, and Moses led them into the wilderness, that was a life-changing moment. There was life before that moment, there was a life in slavery, and then there was a life of freedom and in the wilderness. Today, we see the, the Israelites on the edge of the promised land. They're at another one of these cultural defining moments. So let me bring you up to speed where we are in the scripture today. So as they approached the promised land, Moses sent out 12 spies to see what that land looked like. In chapter 13 in Numbers, they go and explore and then come back with some reports. They report, we entered the land to which you sent us. It's actually full of milk and honey, and this is its fruit. There are, however, powerful people who live in the land. The cities have huge fortifications, and we, have even, we, even, and we even saw the descendants of the Anakites there. The 
Amalekites live in the land of arid southern plain. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the mountains, and the Canaanites live by the sea along the Jordan. The people got upset. And Caleb, he calms them and told them, we must go and take possession of it because we are more than able to do it. But not everyone agreed with this report. Some of them started rumors, and this is what they told the Israelites. The land that we crossed over to explore is a land that devours its residents. All the people we saw in it are huge men. We saw the Nephilim, and the descendants of Anak came from the Nephilim. We saw ourselves as grasshoppers, and that's how we approached them, or, or that's how we appeared to them. The ten spies who started to share these rumors were scared of the new normal they were about to face. They saw people in the promised land. They saw cities and forts. They saw what they thought was too much to overcome. They were looking through a lens of fear into the future. And because of this, they started to spread rumors that they were not going to be able to do what God was calling them to do. They planted seeds of gossip and sabotage and false ideas. And this this worked too, because by the time we get to this section that I'm reading now from Numbers 14, the Back to Egypt Committee was formed and solidified. The Back to Egypt Committee is a self-appointed group of people who think it's best. The best thing they can do is to go back to the normal they know. In the case of the Israelites, it was to go all the way back to the normal of being slaves in Egypt. Now, when you hear that out loud, it it just sounds absurd. But it was how the community was feeling. They were scared of the people in the land and the the fear-based report that they did not want to go on to this journey that God was leading them on. They wanted to pick a leader and go back to Egypt. They'd rather go back to slavery than into a future promised to them by God. Now there were two spies, Caleb and Joshua, that understood who it was that brought them to this point. They understood what it was God who parted the Red Sea, provided manna every morning, showed them the way by using pillars of smoke and fire, and gave them the law and brought them to this moment in time. They gave their report from a faith perspective. They named the reality of the situation, but then they reminded the people of God's presence with them. And after they tear their clothes and mourn the way the people were reacting, they said, as it says in in Numbers 14, 7, starting there, the land we cross through to explore is an extraordinarily good land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he'll bring us into this land and give it to us. It is a land that is full of milk and honey. Only don't rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people in the land. They are our prey. Their defenses have deserted them, but the Lord is with us. So don't be afraid of them. Did you hear that position of faith in their statement? But the Lord is with us, so don't be afraid of them. The reality was good and bad. The land looked good, great even. The part... And the bad part, it was full of people, but God was with us, is what they said. But God is with us. But God is with us. I mean, just think of everything we've gone through in the last four months of 2020. Australia caught on fire. Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter accident. Tensions were raised with Iran, which, according to some people, could have led us to World War III. Then the coronavirus hits, all sports are canceled, millions of people around the world get sick, thousands in our own country have died, hundreds in our own state, and tens of you know, numerous people within our own county. The whole world seems to be on lockdown, Tom Brady isn't even a patriot anymore, and Kim Jong-un may be dead. We haven't been able to worship in person for eight weeks now, and we don't know when it'll end. That, it's insane to think about and to soak up everything that has happened. And it feels like this all should have happened in like within two years instead of two months. It's unbelievable what we have been through. And it's incomprehensible of what this future will look like. But like Caleb and Joshua tell the Israelites, God is with us and we shouldn't be afraid. We can look at our current reality the same way the spies looked at theirs. We can look at it through the lens of fear or faith. 
the choice is ours. The fear-based future is founded from a sense of scarcity, that there isn't enough. The spies, they looked at the people in the promised land and they, they thought, we don't have enough soldiers to defeat their armies. We don't have enough skills to farm the land. We don't have enough people to ready to make this journey. We don't, we don't, we don't. Now, Caleb and Joshua, they saw the same reality. They saw the people in the land and what was ahead of them, but they looked at it from a faith-based future. They understood who it was who had called them to this place and that God would take them into that promised future as well. Instead of looking at what they didn't have, these two spies, these two people of Israel, they looked at what they did have. And because God was with them, that was going to be enough. The new normal Caleb and Joshua were willing to go into was formed in their faith in God, not in fear. We need to remind ourselves of that too. Whatever the new normal is, it will be different, but with God's help, we will get through it. Caleb and Joshua's faith didn't rub off on anybody. No, it says that the crowds wanted to stone them for their thinking that faith was all they needed to enter the promised land. The defiance and disobedience of the people made God extremely upset. These unhappy campers refused to have faith that God would give them the land that God had promised. So God tells Moses, how long will these people disrespect me? How long will they doubt me after all the signs that I performed among them? I'll strike them down with a plague and disown them. Then I'll make you into a great nation stronger than they. Now Moses, after this moment, works his per- per- persuasive skills with God and convinces God not to do that. But then God replies to Moses later on in this chapter, this 14th chapter of Numbers, I'll forgive as you requested, but as I live and as the Lord's glory fills the entire earth, none of the men who saw my glory and the signs I did in Egypt and in the desert, but tested me these ten times and haven't listened to my voice, will see the land I promised to their ancestors. All who disrespected me won't see it, but I'll bring my servant Caleb into the land at that he explored, and his descendants will, pro- will possess it because... He has a different spirit, and he has, reminded, he has remained true to me. And since the Amalekites and the Canaanites live in the valley, tomorrow turn and march in the desert by the route of the Reed Sea. God sends them to wander. The people had forgotten. Their short-term memory failed them again because they forgot everything they came through. The Back to Egypt committee kicked in and told them that slavery without God is better than a future with God. I like how Gil Rehnquist in the book Quietly Courageous puts it. He says this, Instead of believing in the manna that came down from God's hand, the church learned to set its own table and provide its own feast. They relied on their own skills instead of God, and they were afraid. The Israelites took for granted the grace, compassion, and resources God had given them to bring them this far. They forgot the fact that if God had brought them this far, and if they had faith, God would bring them into the promised land. Christy Gingery and I were putting the final touches on a recorded walkthrough of the plans of the building team and the work that they have created for our church and for the parsonage. We hope that we can send this video out soon along with a survey to kind of get people's opinions on the work and if they are excited about it. It was the initial plan, the ideal plan a couple months ago, that last week, that final Sunday of April, we would be able to have a church conference and we'd be able to vote on whether to move forward with these projects or not. And then the coronavirus hit, life was altered, and all those plans were balled up and chucked out the window as far as telling you all. And so we're coming up with new ways to share this news and to work with everybody because when we're able to move forward, when that new normal comes back, we need to be ready. We need to be ready to move. I want us as a church to be willing to head into these projects and our new normal with a faith, with a faith-based future. Now we need to ask the hard questions. We need to take a good, hard look at what really is possible and what isn't. But then we need to ask ourselves this question, if the plans for the future are coming from a place of fear or of faith. 
If we're talking out of faith, then whatever we decide to do, then God will help us through it. If we make the decision with a fear-based future, then we may be sent to wander. I've seen on the back of cars recently stickers that say, All who wander are not lost. And the truth is, the Israelites were not lost. They didn't have faith in God to follow through and to take them into the promised land. They saw the hard task in front of them, sacrifices they might have to make, struggles they would have, and fear squelched that faith. My prayer, as we continue to live into this just absurd reality that we are in, is that when we are at the edge of the promised land, when the pandemic ends, when we're ready to move forward with our building projects and when we're ready to gather together again, when we're ready to face that new normal, that we do so with eyes and hearts of faith. May we be like Caleb and Joshua. May we know and always remember that God is with us so we don't have to be afraid. And all God's people said, Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for who you are and how have you brought us so this far, so how far you have brought us so far. As we live into these months of pandemic and being in lockdown and worshiping online and just this, this weird normal that we are living through, may we constantly remember who you are and we, may we never forget our faith in you to be our God. So guide us as we go into this future. To whatever that new normal is, Lord, we just simply ask you to take our hand and to lead us. May we make decisions about the future of our church, the future of our worship and buildings from a faith-based perspective on the future. Because Lord, if you are with us, we do not have to be afraid. We ask this in your name. Amen. And now, as the uh, benediction that is found in this section of the scripture says, May the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Blessed be the time.